says R. Um, all right, so we'll kick it off. Um, the title of this session, because I submitted this talk probably three months ago, was centered around CI for continuous integration. CI is just kind of a part of that, but what we wanted to focus on was how you supercharge your development flow, right? So, you know, we'll hit on CI, we'll hit on a lot of different pieces, but this is, is meant to be a little more uh, comprehensive than what the original intent is. I'm Jason Dodds, I'm the Director of Delivery at Code Science. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, and Captain Sexy over here is? I'm John Nelson. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, John Aaron Nelson, and I'm a, just a regular old developer. What a good one. Really, really good one. <laughs> All right, we want to thank our platinum sponsors. They've done an awesome job. They helped fund this. Uh, they were able to help fund this because Squid and Map Anything got real big venture capital money. And that's been awesome. Heck yeah. All right, so who we are, right? We introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm a former engineer. I was an engineer for a long time. I'm an agile enthusiast. I believe in process. I have to hire engineers. Uh, and in this presentation, I'll basically be a scrum master persona. I'm in charge of making sure that what we're doing is deployed right and everything works and we're doing things with a high quality manner. And John, who are you? Um, I uh, love JavaScript. I'm a developer. I try to specialize in the front end, but I get pushed into doing pretty much everything. Um, so part of what we're going to, uh, well, one of the things that Mohit is demoing in the other room, but one of the things we're going to talk about today is using force code. Force code is an extension for Visual Studio Code that you can use to uh, do your Salesforce development. So you don't have to use Maven's Need or the force.com IDE or whatever else it is. And who wrote it? Um, I wrote it. So <laughs> yeah. Um, and as we're going through this, I'm the developer. He's the scrum master. So yeah, it's kind of gives us our roles. So uh, let me ask this. Is anybody in here a Lightning developer? Developed in Lightning? Good, because I was going to ask you to leave and go to Mo's presentation, which is excellent. <laughs> um, all right, so who are we with? We're with, we're with Code Science, right? And our goal is to help SaaS companies get to ACV, which is annual contract value, faster on the Salesforce platform, right? So we build apps for the App Exchange. We're the only master PDO. We've built 90 apps for the App Exchange. We've got headquarters, and our headquarters in, is in Chattanooga. We also have an office in um, San Francisco, a bunch of folks in Atlanta, we've got folks in Portland. We're kind of all over the place. Um, but we have 162 certifications, two CTAs. We've got folks that like to code. We like to develop. And this is basically what this presentation is kind of like how we do things, um, which hopefully is good for everybody else too. So what do we pursue? Saying, you know, we're developers. We like to do things on the App Exchange. We each want to be individually effective. So each developer, you want them running at their full efficiency and not being mired down with all the things that people don't like about Salesforce, especially developers. Uh, we also want them to work in a team, right? We want to get more than one of these folks working together. We want three or four engineers, um, but we want to do it well, right? We want quality baked into what we do. Um, we also follow agile principles. We try to find the elegant solution, right? We don't want this stuff to be overly complicated and we want it to be fun, right? Because if your job sucks, it sucks. It doesn't matter what tools you have, it doesn't matter what process, it's just a bad job. So let's make it fun. Um, so the things that we're going to focus on for this top talk are the top three, right? Increased individual effectiveness, teamwork, and quality. And to make an individually effective developer, I'm going to let John take it away with what do we need? What do we do? So. Um one of the biggest needs that I've found as a developer is having open source tools available where I can look at the source code, modify them, extend them, manipulate them, do whatever I want to do with them. So, you know, open source and extensible is extremely important um, in the IDE and all the tool different toolings that you have. Um, I want to be able to make a change and see the result as fast as I can, whether it be deploying something, testing something locally, especially testing something locally, it provides the fastest feedback cycle. So we want to try to get as close to immediate as possible. Um, I really like having integrated source control. Source control in GitHub is extremely important in all of our projects. It's the source of truth. It's the most vital, integral part of our entire process. Um, and we also need to make sure that we don't step on each other's toes. So people talk about having 20 developers in the same sandbox, and it's a nightmare. Um, even having developers share a similar, uh, a unique, or a same developer org is, is not ideal. 
So we like to have each developer working in their own siloed development org, but also be able to integrate with everything everybody else is doing uh, eventually up the pipeline and do that in a safe way that's you know, resilient and not gonna cause us problems. So we also wanna be able to take away the headaches of pushing our code up to the org and pulling that down those changes that we have in the click and, uh, point and click model. Because that's the great thing about Salesforce, that you can go through and point and click and change anything you want to, pretty much anything you want to. But how do you get that back into your org? There is a lot of complicated processes with the different ant configurations or different processes you can go through with Maven's Mate. We want to try to simplify it as much as we can. And we want to make it simple, easy. You know, complex things are difficult, obviously, by their very nature. Uh, you don't want to um, take and pursue these arcane, difficult solutions to get your solution, to get your problem solved. You know, you want to take the simplest path, the easiest way for everybody else to get kind of ramped up as quickly as possible. So um, the build process is kind of the beginning of that whole thing. Um, so we like to use Webpack, as denoted by that pretty little diamond thing there. Um, there are also a lot of other Node.js tools that are out there, Grunt and Gulp, those are kind of older uh, solutions. A lot of people uh, replace those tools with just regular old NPM scripts, so you can also do that. But Webpack is really kind of the, the darling of the internet nowadays. And uh, with Webpack 2.0 and the tree shaking stuff, you can take and code split your, uh, your modules and get as uh, minimal of code as possible to the user as quickly as possible to get them to see something rendered on the page as soon as it can, uh, and then lazy load the rest of your components uh, down the road. And, and it does that kind of intelligently. Um, so the part of the build process is making sure that the, your code is small and compact and uh, easily able to be shipped down to the client as fast as possible. So we use uh, Webpack processes that basically lint, uh, tell us what all the errors are in our code and tell us what practices we're missing. Um, so compress that code down, get, all, get rid of all the white space so you, you know, get your file size down more and make it, you know, a lot of times it's easier to uh, show your code out there if you obfuscate it a little bit. So you take and replace your variable names with, you know, A or B or C or D or whatever, you know, really kind of make it both shrink the code and make it difficult for somebody else to kind of steal it. Um, so along with that, there's a plugin that we use called Webpack Salesforce Deploy that we use with Webpack and all, a lot of our projects that when it builds, it immediately ships it up to Salesforce. So there's kind of this immediate feedback cycle between building something and then getting it out uh, visually on the cloud. Um, so we also use other tools in our build process. Um, namely, we use JSR mocks from the previous slide that enables us to create uh, JSON mocks, so just a flat JSON object, or you can even use uh, functions to create an object itself and use that as kind of the fake return from the remote call. And along with that, you have to use a lot of remote actions in order to make sure that you get that nice JSON parsing uh, back and forth. And just to provide some context on this and what John's kind of going over in this build process, this is for UI development. So we do a lot of development in Angular, React, mm -hmm. things like that, spa development. So, you know, you've got a lot of files, you have node modules, you have all of these things that ultimately need to go into a static resource, which is only five megabytes, right? So what this process does is it allow you to manage those files to work just like people who are building Angular apps do on any platform, but then have some Salesforce kind of specific tooling that will take that, zip it up, drop it in a static resource, and then that way, you know, when we're talking about bringing new people to the platform, this is perfect because this is how most web developers work, right? So it's mm -hmm. having that common tooling that uh, we're using in the midst of a Salesforce. Yeah, platform. so we really like to, as often as we can, map that real world best practices onto Salesforce, and we love tools like Webpack and JSR Mox. They're well. great. So JSR mocks, I guess I switched the slides a little bit. So JSR mocks helps us do our uh, rapid development. So like I said, JSR mocks, uh, it's a tool out there, open source, you know, out on GitHub that, um, like I said, you create a static JSON object to represent the response from what your call would be. And the magic of this is that you can create that JSON object first. And then once you figured out what your data model should look like on the front end, you have the front end looking like it should, then you go create your Salesforce object model. Then you go create your remote actions and you fill in the gaps in between the, the front and the back end. So you can get that really, really fast iteration uh, early on when it's really costly the most. And then later on when you've kind of 
you know, standardize what you're going to be actually doing, you can take and solidify that model up in Salesforce and actually start pushing data back and forth. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's really great because it enables that fast feedback cycle. So how many people have made, uh, was working on a UI in Salesforce and was changing something in the CSS or HTML and had to change it and click save and wait and refresh and you had to do that over and over and over to get something done? That Nightmare. thing kills a lot of time. So when uh, John was alluding to this build to a contract session, what we usually do is when we're, you know, we're trying to get to market as fast as possible. So back end devs have to work at the same time as front end devs. So our contract is that JSON payload. So we say, hey, back end devs, you write your business logic, you write the apex to deliver this, and I'm gonna take this JSON and I'm gonna work locally and I'm gonna build my UI using that. Yep. And our designers, our front end developers, they're just humming because yep. they're doing everything locally. And then once it looks good, boom, we use Webpack, we push it up to Salesforce, and then we're, we're accelerating prototyping, development on the platform at a, a pretty rapid rate. It's really great because you get developers or designers that might not know how to code, but they know how to do HTML and CSS. And you don't want to kind of shoe them, shoehorn them into the Salesforce uh, world when they're really good at what they do. So we let people be good at what they're good at and not force them to do things that they're not good at. So make things simpler, make things nobody, easier to nobody use. Nobody wants that. So along with that, um, I about a year ago, a year and a half ago or something like that, I was a little bit frustrated with the tooling out there. I thought things were a little too complex, too, uh, too many different tools that you had to kind of get everything working just right at the same time. A lot of really heavy configuration of files that I would get errors all the time, not figure out, not understand why. I would spend an hour or two figuring out that, oh, I was missing this configuration setting right here in my a little tool that I was using to retrieve down. And that's, you, know, you don't want to waste time. You know, your time is very valuable and you don't want to take and waste time uh, messing with your tooling. You know, you need something that works, something that's uh, easy, something that's fast, something that's simple. So I created Force Code. Um, Force Code is built on Visual Studio Code. If you don't know what Visual Studio Code is, you should know it because in the last year and a half, since it's been in general release, it's acquired a more than a quarter of the market share for IDEs across the market. So um, people are getting rid of full Visual Studio, adopting Visual Studio Code, getting rid of Sublime Text, going to Visual Studio Code, all these different kinds of developers across all different uh, specialties, web development, app development, mobile development, they're all using Visual Studio Code. Everybody's adopting it. So if you don't know what it is, it's a great IDE, very, very simple, extremely simple. There's five icons, you know, that's really all you need. You know, it doesn't have anything you don't need, doesn't have any, or, and it has pretty much everything that you do need. Any, anybody use IntelliJ? or Eclipse or anything like that. It's kind of like the opposite of that. It's yeah. fast and it's lean and it's... Yeah, exactly. you know, IntelliJ has uh, tons of menus, tons of menus to go through, tons of different panels and, you know, setting files to go through and it's extremely extensible because it can we don't want any of that. use anything, right? But we don't want something like that. We want something simple, tailored to web development and able to be used with Salesforce. So uh, Visual Studio Code has a regular release cycle. Uh, it's sponsored by Microsoft. It's made by Eric Gamo, one of the you know, best developers out there, best architects out there. Um, Force Code, the, the extension that I have, is kind of a response to Lightning development being painful. Um, I was trying to develop a Lightning app about a year and a half ago, and nothing. I couldn't find anything that worked right. I was, it was incredibly frustrating trying to get something that actually could save my file. Just, just save it, you know? So I basically made it to where I could uh, save, create, save, you know, retrieve whatever lightning files, everything else needed. Uh, other things about Visual Studio Code is it has a great integrated Git uh, panel. You know, I've mentioned the five icons. Git is one of those panels. Uh, they're, in the next version that they're putting out, they're gonna make it extensible so you can use any version control system with it. But it is tailored towards GitHub. And it's, an ex it's the best GitHub interface that I've found. You know, it's simple, it's easy to use, it's, it's uh, it makes sense from a, from a beginner standpoint. Git can be really confusing if you come to it and you don't understand it. It can take months to actually you know, come up on it. But Visual Studio Code really simplifies all that process with adding, cleaning, committing, all that stuff. Um, another great thing about all this is that it's totally free and open. So free. you can so you can uh, you awesome. can you can extend it, you can fork it, you can you can request, you can do pull requests, you can look through issues, you can do all that stuff completely free, completely open in every way. So, all right, so I'm a manager who manages developers. I want people like John working as a team. It takes teamwork to make the dream work. 
Um, so what do you need, right? We need uh, to collaborate with ease, right? We need a segmentation of roles. Some people are back end, some people are front end, some people are declarative. Um, we want code promotion and QA policies, right? We just don't want people running roughshod and pushing things all over the place. Uh, we want a series of checks and balances, right? We don't want somebody just dropping a nuclear bomb in our code and messing up the managed package that we've worked so hard to develop. Uh, and we want to ensure quality, right? You know, going, keep going back to quality, man. What we do has to be right, you know? So let's bake that in. So we solve that with continuous integration. See, I told everybody we'd get to it. I'll come uh, right. Yeah, so here's our code promotion strategy. And I know these are kind of like hard to see. And I went, oh, awesome, it works. So uh, these little blocks up here, anything that's a block is an org, right? So you'll see we've got a lot of orgs. We've got one for each developer. Uh, we've got one for our integration branch. And then we have one that's our packaging org, right? So um, anything that's a little cylinder here is Git or GitHub branch. So the way that we work this is we have, uh, John is working in his org, right? He gets everything right and how he wants it. He does a commit to his local branch, or maybe he wants to do a lot of things. So he's got a couple of commits. Once he gets that commit done, he'll push it to his branch up on GitHub. And then our CI process takes that and redeploys it back to his org. You say, man, you guys have been making a lot of sense, but that sounds stupid. Shouldn't that be exactly the same? It is exactly the same. But what we do here is run all of our Apex unit tests. So if John sometimes breaks things, we know when he broke it and it yep. happens right then and we get the feedback yep. cycle. So once this gets done, John said, man, I'm done with my features. I'm ready to share with the team. He submits a pull request to the next like integration branch. And then he says, hey, Jason, I need you to go review my pull request, right? Make sure that I'm using best practices, that everything looks good. Um, I'll approve his pull request. And then that merges it into the integration branch in GitHub. And our CI process says, well, here's the org tied to that branch. I'm going to take it and deploy it to this org, running all of the unit tests. So this is how you get multiple developers working on a single code stream in tandem and have a way to, uh, for them to collaborate. Uh, the last piece down here, when it finally gets to the master branch, the master branch is the king daddy in uh, Git, uh, it pushes it to our packaging org. So if any of you are ISVs and there's only 15 people in here maybe, so you're probably not, um, you never want to do development in your packaging org. That's why we have all of this, because by the time it gets here, then we want to say, all right, it's ready to be packaged. I can submit this to uh, yeah. security review and everything's good to go. Yeah, the goal is that once the code gets down here, that it never has a bug in it. You know, bugs can surface here because you have different developers merging their code into one shared code base. But this branch, eventually, once you get things right, should be right. And when that's right, you push it into master. And that way, you can always be sure that this branch mm -hmm. you can always deploy from. You can always cut a new package from whenever somebody asks for it. And we only have one, you know, the, the cream in the Oreo right here. There could be three of these, right? Mm -hmm. We could have QA, UAT. We could have demo orgs. We can mm -hmm. have any amount of orgs that we want. All we have to do is tie that to a branch and then have CI process pick it up and roll it and deploy it. So the goal here is to make Git the source of truth, not an org in Salesforce, um, which is pretty key. And I know that we use this for ISV development. Most of you probably work in single orgs or with sandboxes or things like that. You use change sets. A lot of times you forget things that are in change sets. Uh, the next slide that comes up will you know, kind of alleviate some of that. But we want to make Git the source of truth. Not and, and also, this looks really complicated. But realize that underneath it, the only thing that drives all of this is a five-line configuration file for CircleCI. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a very simple configuration once you know what to do. It's really easy to get it up, get it, up, get it working, and fix problems with it. Because and, it's, and what, go ahead, man. Merge conflicts happen continually. I mean, that's, that's the reality of development is people change things at the same time everywhere. And this, is the, this integration branch is where all that merge conflict, merge resolution happens. So that way you can make sure that you get everything set right the way it should be, and then you can take and push it into where you're safe. It, and a merge conflict isn't a dirty word. Because yeah. a merge conflict you can handle. Yes. Overwriting somebody else's code. Yes. That sucks. Yes. Uh, but one learning that we've had, and John was instrumental in this, uh, our CI process is JavaScript based. Um, uh, many of you may have used the Ant migration tool, which is written in Java, 
been around for a long time. We used it for CI for quite a bit. If you do any lightning development, because it's on the Java stack, it's got a bug in it where that thing will blow up when you get close to 20 lightning components. And I know that sounds a lot, but if you're doing a fairly decent size interface that has nested components, it can compile pretty quickly. Yep. So we wrote everything using JavaScript to, uh, to get around that. Yeah, for example, one of our teams recently had a three or four week uh, design sprint uh, or two sprints, and they created 45 lightning components. Yeah. So in a very short amount of time, you can create a ton of components and you know, it's hit like that Like using React, man, those things are gonna come around. So how do we move all of the code around? You know, we talked about Circle CI, we talked about CI in general, that's a process, right? But we use packages, and there was an earlier talk about using managed packages. We don't use managed packages per se to do this, but a pa you can go create a package in Salesforce and you can just say, well, here's all the code and objects that need to go in it, right? So I've got four objects, four classes, three Visual Forces page. I can say all of that stuff is in a package and give that package a name. So it sounds like that doesn't do a whole lot, but what's really cool is you can run, run com one command and say, go get me this package, and it'll suck all of that information down, right? So instead of just having everything unmanaged kind of in your org, uh, you can have multiple packages in an org. If you've got a namespace, you can only have one managed package, but if you're using just regular packages, you can have one, three, five packages in a single org, and it makes a moving of code and declarative items Really, really simple. And really, if you're doing development, you're already using packages. If you don't know what packages are, you're still using them because really all it is is a package XML file. You know, you look in your source directory, you have that package XML. That's your package. If you put a name at the top, it's a named unmanaged package. If you put in a packaging org and manage it, well, now it's managed package. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing from you not knowing what it is to being a managed package, it's still the same file, no changes in configuration. And one of the things that caused people a lot of headache, as John mentioned, is this package XML file, which is a pretty much a manifest that says, here's everything that's in my package. Mm -hmm. Well, what John developed is, and like we said, everything is JavaScript based, de developed an NPM module that'll go create this package XML based off of a directory that you have on your computer, right? So if you've got your source folder, because everybody's got every, all their stuff in source, it'll go trellis all of that and say, here's your package XML. You can deploy that without having to do any kind of uh, manual steps. Yeah, and if we went back to that original slide with the with the graph, this is where the whole reason we do this is a lot of has a lot of the reason uh, going back to that package XML file. You know, if you create something in your org and you don't put it in your package XML XML file, when you try, try to deploy it back up to your org, it's like whoa, whoa, whoa you can't do that. You've signed the package. So in that way, that's how we get rid of a lot of those packaging bugs right there in that process, and then down here is where we you know resolve all those merge conflicts. Yep. Uh, so, Git and GitHub, you know, we've been using these things uh, kind of interchangeably. I'm sure a lot of you kind of already know what this is. Um, but like we said before, we want the files in Git. Git is a version control tool. GitHub is a place that'll host Git re uh, repositories. Um, we want the files in Git to be our source of truth. So if any of you attended the DX talk, it's the same kind of principle, right? Um, we want to be able to easily branch and version these things, right? So if John's working on something and he's in his developer branch, and he's like, dude, I want to try something that's way off the wall, which John often does. He can create a branch real quick. He can work on those things. And then whenever it's done, he can say, man, that sucked. I don't want that branch anymore and just delete it. Or like, oh, this is fantastic. Let me merge that into my developer branch and get it into the, uh, the org. So GitHub hosts these Git repositories. Uh, pull requests are your friends. It's a great way to um, uh, you know, monitor the activity that's gone in. You can uh, encapsulate uh, separate Git commits. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. Um, and then member management. So you can go in and say, well, here's the five people that should be able to access my code. Here's admins, people can clone it. And you can share that code with other people via their GitHub handles, which are cool. Mm -hmm. So this is probably the coolest thing on the planet. And I don't know if you guys have used it or not, but um, when I talked about us refactoring our um, uh, CI process to use JavaScript, a lot of what we're able to do on the tooling side in general, CI, Visual Studio Code, or Force Code, uh, is all from JS Force. And JS Force is a JavaScript library or an NPM module that wraps all of the Salesforce APIs the REST API, the batch API, the tooling, metadata, everything. Uh, you can handle all sorts of uh, authentication with it. Um, it's heavily used in UI and node development. 
So if you do any kind of node development, man, JS forces your Huckleberry. Um, works great with our continuous integration services, and we talked about DX before. DX, it's fantastic. It's going to be great for the developer community, but it's nothing new. It's all built on JS Force. We've been doing this stuff for a while. We're familiar with it. I'm glad that Salesforce is making an investment to get that out in the larger community. And overall, this is what drives continuous integration. So there's Circle CI, there's Travis CI, there's CodeShip, there's Jenkins, there's all these different kind of tools you can use. Uh, Circle CI is our preferred vendor. But here's what it does. You know, whenever there's a commit to a branch, it's listening to GitHub and it'll say, all right, I'm gonna take that, the code in that branch and I'm gonna redeploy it in the org. So it's listening, it's out there waiting to run. We run yeah. tests on every build. So anytime something runs, we've got flags in there that say run all the Apex unit tests. If you guys have um, Selenium tests, anything like that, where you want to do automated functional testing, you can write it into the, um, the five-line file that John was talking about for, for Circle. Um, you want to passively identify failures early and often, right? So if something breaks, you want to know who did it. You want to know right when it happens. You don't want to find a bug that breaks a unit test three months down the road after you're ready to release. Um, and keep all that broken stuff out of your master branch. Right? The goal is to have shippable software coming out of one branch in GitHub, and that's the master. So other cool stuff you can do with it is uh, CircleCI is based off a of hook architecture, so you can have a hook to not notify people on Slack, which we do. So if John breaks something, it'll say on the project the channel on Slack, you know, John broke the build, and we can all mock him and <laughs> yell at him to go fix it. Um, but one of the cool things, and I don't know how much this applies to folks in the room, is with a tool like CircleCI, it allows people from a governance perspective who aren't devs or TAs, you can be an admin or a BA or somebody else, a, a deployment specialist, can promote and deploy code to production through point and click tools. You don't have to know anything about Git or continuous integration or any of that stuff to get code to your production org, which is dope. So we did all that stuff, right? We got all these real cool tools, we've got continuous integration, man, we're jiving. We got to build in quality. Right, because we don't want to do this and just put out some hack software with a bunch of errors and those kind of things. So in order to build in quality, we have a couple of needs here too, right? We want a common language and understanding, right? If a BA is saying, this is what this thing needs to do, and a QA is saying, well, how do I test this, you know, and the developers are like, you know, well, what do you want me to do? I can do anything, I'm amazing. Um, we want a common language and understanding, right? We want a process that people can follow where we say, they're like, look, you know, I'm done with this, what happens next, right? We want that process to say, well, it goes to QA, and QA approves it, and then we do this, and then we do UAT. Um, but one of the big things is we need a QA strategy, right? We just don't want to build something and have it sit there and say like, oh, well, let me just go poke around and click, and yeah, that works. We want to be able to test this thing and have a strategy for doing it each sprint, each release. QA strategy is big. Uh, we'll head on again, automated tests that run often. Right? We want things that, you know, we want to work without, uh, you know, we want to work free and unfettered. And the only way that you can do that is if you have a test layer that says, all right, this is what this thing's supposed to do. That way we can go innovate, we can move very quickly, we can run in an agile fashion. And if we do something that goes against the test and the test breaks, great. I can go back and fix that real quick. Uh, we need a definition of done. When is this feature finished? Uh, we need consistent releases, right? So we don't want to do this every four months, five months yearly for your releases, you want to be able to release software every two weeks. It's continuous deployment. So you can adapt to market needs. Um, and one of the big things is, and this is key in the developer community and Salesforce or anything else, you need an avenue for mentorship, right? You're going to have people who aren't as experienced come in. You want, you know, your old hairs are sitting there, you know, they've been around the block for a little bit. You want to be able to help out the younger folks, right? John, did anybody help you with that when you were coming up? Yeah, I mean, I had a number of different people that helped me. I mean, everybody at the company is great, you know. That's how we build in quality. Teamwork quality individuals, quality in software, quality in all things, right? So, do you want to talk about code review? I can talk about it if you want to talk about it. Sure, I mean, code review is one of the uh, most important parts of the process. Um, it, 
on the surface, it's for uh, finding issues with somebody else's code, but really it acts as a vehicle to facilitate communication between you know, uh, a person who's more experienced and somebody who's lesser experienced, and it's supposed to provide a way to communicate, a way to talk about code and in kind of like a, a, an other manner, like it's over here, so we're just gonna talk about it like this. So oh, one of the greatest thing, one of the things that you do at the beginning is you take and create the pull request, you create the comment about what the actual pull request is supposed to do. Pull requests are supposed to be small and isolated and targeted to what they want. A lot of times we can't do that because we build a feature that you know, has to be all-encompassing. You know, I've had uh, commits that have you know, 50, 100 changed files in it. Mm -hmm. That's not good. You know, you're, you're, your pull request is supposed to have you know, a few files in it. And, you know, a, you're supposed to be able to look at it on a page and be like, yeah, that's good enough and pass it through. But you know, we live in the real world, so that's not really all the time uh, possible. So yeah, you know, you create the pull request. Um, once you do that, the, that pull request uh, uh, process uh, a lot of times will uh, be the engine that kicks off that, that build process up in uh, Circle CI because it watches for those pull requests. And uh, you get notifications from those pull requests in Slack and different places. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it just provides a great way for people to collaborate. And, and the cool thing, I don't know if you can see it right here, but the flow would be, you know, in this specific instance, you know, I had code that I changed in my branch. Um, you know, I can go in here and mention John. I say, hey, John, you know, this is what this thing does. Do you mind taking a look at this? I go create pull request. The pull request is sitting out there. John gets an email notification mm -hmm. with my comments in there. He goes in, he takes a look at it. Maybe we have some comments in here going back and forth. Maybe I mess something up, which I often do. I can go in, I can change it. The pull request will update with my new commits. Um, and then when everything's good to go, John can say, hey, I approve this pull request and it'll merge that into the integration branch. So mm -hmm. at mentioning people is great. And then also, these pull requests are maintained, and there's integrations with Jira and other like, you know, uh, ticketing systems, if you want to call it that, uh, where you can say, well, here's a feature that I'm working on. It's mapped to this pull request. Yeah. I can go back. I can see the conversations that happened. I can yeah. see everything that went into it. So this one's key. Like we said, everybody's developers in here, right? How much code coverage do you have to have to push something to production? 75%. 75%. Most people write Apex unit tests to get to 75% code coverage. And I've done it, I've seen hacks, I'm not putting anybody down for it. But what you really need to be doing is writing Apex tests that, that prove your business logic, not for code coverage. If you do that, you'll get code coverage, you'll get excellent code coverage. But what this provides you is a framework where you can say, look, I can go develop and I know my code works the way that's supposed to because I've got unit tests that provide my business logic. So if you've got these things and proving out your business logic, a couple of tip, tips, bulkify everything. You should bulkify everything in general, but all of your unit tests, make sure that it doesn't run on just one record, that it can run on 20, 100, that it's scalable. Uh, include positive and negative tests. That means enforce the things you know that should be happening, and if it shouldn't happen, also test for that. Uh, one of the things that kind of helps out for us is to have consistent test data. So we'll create as a set of classes, some factory classes where if we're saying, you know, in our uh, data model, we need an account and a contact and an opportunity and all that kind of stuff. Instead of doing that in every test, we can just run one line that says, hey, test factory, go scaffold my uh, data. And uh, it's really key to understand uh, unit test patterns like call out mocks. If you're developing an integration where you're calling out to another provider, you can create a mock and a test class which will respond and you can respond with different um, payloads, with different error codes, with different um, HTTP headers. And there's also a test setup feature where um, if you have a suite of tests, you can just say, hey, for every one of these tests, run this specific set of code, create this data, and then all the tests will use that once. You don't have to repeat it every time for your unit test. And it might seem like writing more tests and more tests and more tests is kind of a waste of time. You know, once you get past that 75% coverage, what does it really matter, right? Well, it might seem slower, but this is what enables teams to speed up because, mm -hmm. you know, you put your commit out there, you didn't really, you know, do a whole bunch of testing to it, but you have a general idea about what you're supposed to do. You push it up there, it builds the thing, it, you get a build failure, you go find, oh, I, this test failed. So I go fix this test, I push it back up there, then it gets merged into another branch, gets merged into the integration, somebody else puts some code in that changes your code, it goes and undoes the fix that you did, that test fails. So this really enables that 
you don't have to think about it process. All you do is push, com push, push your code and, it's, and let it do its thing. Let it figure out what the bugs are, let it figure out. This also gives you peace of mind. Yeah. Because you know if you've got a clean build, that thing works. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a set of unit tests that test what your app is supposed to do, you never really know. You've got somebody that says, oh yeah, it's great, it didn't have any bugs in it. Yeah. Do you know that for sure? Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Yep. And so another pattern that we have on this, and we won't dig too far into it, are functional tests. Right, so you can have these automated tests with Apex, it, you know, test out your business logic, the code that you have in your app, but some stuff you just have to go point and click through, right? So what functional tests are, um, are those point and click kind of uh, pieces, but we wanna automate those, right? Because if we're doing regression testing, we don't want them to go through and have to go through two hours of testing for every change that we wanna do. So what we use functional tests for is we write some JavaScript, um, a test, and we use uh, codesep.io and intern and a couple other tools to kind of write these things. But they execute in the browser and they mimic real user interactions, right? I'm gonna click on this, I'm gonna fill this out, I'm gonna go through a form, I'm gonna submit, what do I get back? The cool thing about these, um, if you're working in an environment where you're gonna deploy this and it's gonna be on mobile or it's gonna be on Chrome and IE and Firefox and you need to ensure that that works, you can write one set of tests and then with a tool like Sauce Labs or Browser Stack or something like that, you can run it and say, go run this on Chrome, IE, Firefox, and on mobile, but also run it on Windows, Linux, Mac OS, you know, anything else. So you can have different combinations of devices, operating system, uh, viewports, platforms. So that's really cool. And this is really just Selenium. I know a lot of you probably know what Selenium is. If you don't, it's really just a, it's a Java automation tool that basically enables uh, Java script or Java process to send commands to a browser. So one of the things that we, I really love JavaScript. I'm a JavaScript evangelist. Really? So, <laughs> really? So we use intern.js, uh, WebDriver.io for our other things too. Uh, Codecept.io, those are all JavaScript tools. So if you see one of the themes that goes, goes through this entire talk is that all of the tooling that we use is all JavaScript based. So you don't need to worry about learning Python or Java or all this other stuff. You can adopt JavaScript and do everything you need to do. And the JavaScript is key because uh, with tools like we mentioned that we use, it makes creating those tests really easy. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about those tests are you can run them all locally. So as part of your build process or whatever, you're like, okay, I'm doing a commit. Let me run all of my um, regression tests, my functional tests. Dude, it'll just sit there and hum. Be like, okay, man, you got the green light. So ease of creation, maintenance, understanding what this thing does, that's key for this, right? Because we've done plenty of QE work where we had to write everything in a Java stack because it was the client's piece. It sucks, right? So mm -hmm. we're trying to get this easily maintainable. So, you know, functional tests, Apex tests, those are another suite of code for your application. Right, you're gonna to have to maintain it, you're gonna to have to update it, there's modifications need to be made, but you don't want it to be onerous, right? Yeah. You want it to be fun, yeah. have fun here. And, and you know, it's really enables your QA team, um, it, it should enable your QA team. So it's too much of the time QA folks are, you know, they point and click and go through mm -hmm. the process and they can spend hours, you know, testing a process that should be automated and you can give them these automated tools. They can run them whenever they're ready, watch the process as it goes through and then, you know, tell the developers what. And the, the key part of this, and we'll harken back to it, we talked about QA strategy. QA strategy tells you what you're testing in this, what you're testing in this and what's going to be manual. Mm -hmm. And everybody agrees upon it, that's how we make sure that quality's baked in and we're doing everything that we're supposed to be doing. So these functional tests, these can also get run just like the Apex unit tests do as part of the CI process. So every step that we're walking up, you don't have to run it on every developer commit, you can, or sometimes mm -hmm. if you're moving from QA to UAT, we're gonna run our whole test suite across all browsers, across all combinations and that's how we make sure that the thing works. You really want to kind of keep these functional tests to as bare minimum as you can because mm. they do have a tendency to randomly fail. Um, we are, I was watching a demo. Like we all do. Right, I was watching a demo of uh, somebody yesterday when they were demoing their code. They had a set of Selenium scripts that they had run 10 times before they went to demo. They demoed it, it failed. And it's, a lot of times it's just because browser might take a, a few extra milliseconds to render something and it doesn't have that ability to click on it yet so it fails the test. So really, the, you do this 
before with behavior driven development, BDD, you do this before you write your code and on the back end. So in the front end, the back end, not really in the middle because in the middle it, you, you get a lot of false positives or false negatives. Yep. So that's pretty much what we had in store. Uh, you know, as part of this, this uh, presentation will be distributed. We have a couple of links here. One's to Force Code, uh, with John's plugin that he wrote. We have a demo repo. So that's got a local build process, kind of a React piece, kind of a CI greenhouse that we have that still in a little bit of development, but within a week it'll be ready to go. You can download that. That's uh, public. We talked about JSR Mocks, the tool that we use to do local development, which is real cool. Um, and then the rest of the stuff is a little bit of us, a little bit of everything else. The Salesforce packaging guide, that's, I think it's the ISV force packaging guide if you're trying to find it. Um, this tells you what you can and can't package and how packages work. So if you're developer nerds that really like to know how Salesforce works, that's key. That's a part of the fundamental core on how things get distributed, moved, deployed, all those things. Got a link to the JS Force library, have a blog post on writing effective unit tests that I believe the Salesforce developers did. Have an internal blog post that one of our QA uh, resources did about um, small and large project test strategies, right? We talked about QA strategy and how there's important. We got a good resource there. Uh, and then the last one, we've got another repository that we did and it's an agile testing starter with intern. Something you can clone down, start to build tests and run them. And how can they get all these links? Are we going to take and publish this slide deck to like a Twitter or something like that? Yeah, you, um, we had our uh, Twitter information up front. Uh, I'll go back to that so you guys can see it. You can either uh, holler at me or holler at John. And then I think when the videos and everything else get published for this conference, this will be a part of it. So that's us giving back to the community. And that's right. it. What, what questions do you guys have? I know there was a lot of content, right? No questions? Was it that boring? <laughs> so, I mean, you were talking about the developer and the <coughs> rep, the different roles that mm -hmm. exist, and, and you mentioned that the, um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, functional tests. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how are the developers running the functional tests every time they do their own build within their own? So, I could kind of, I. A lot of people advocate that you run functional tests all the time, but like I said, it's prone to give false negatives, false failures. So like I was trying to say is you do it up front and at the end. It's not really part of this process. Um, because you do it in a behavior driven development style where you take and write your functional test first and it fails and you go drill down deeper and deeper and you work from the outside in and you, then you create your integration test and you work until that doesn't really suffice anymore and then you create your unit test. So those are really your three testing layers, and if you do BD first, you, you, know, you start from the outside in. So that's really, you, you create your feature up here, and then you push it into the code, and then after here, and then after all this process, it's been pushed up into, the, actually it's probably more like the integration branch, the, the QA person will probably take this test and click a button and watch it go through the entire process and get a report at the end, and then they, then they can report back to the developers, this test failed, this test failed. Um, we do have some projects where this, uh, the functional tests run on commit, and um, those builds take about an hour. You can, so, you, can, um, you can add a couple of lines to your Circle CI yeah. script file and just yep. say, okay, now we're doing all this stuff. Now when this is done, go run mm -hmm. those. In the same tests. way, yeah, in the same way you run those tests on your command line, you know, just with a single thing, cucumber or whatever, mm -hmm. you tool you're like, using to do your testing with. Um, you know, you run that one command, you just, you just put that command in your Circle YAML file, and it'll take and run it whenever it gets to it. So it's, uh, shouldn't, running stuff on Circle CI shouldn't be any different than running things on your local development machine. But like I said, people do kind of get in that trap where they think that it's the end all be all to do something. I was that way about a year ago. I was like, let's make functional everything. And I was like, no, actually. Yeah. So um, part of your test strategy, know yeah. what you're going to test yes. functionally. It should be things that are taking an individual who you love and care for hours to do and are very repetitive. Mm -hmm. Let's take that and automate it so we can take that off their plate. Yep. That way they can get to testing the yep. things that are a little tougher to test or yep. things that are more recent and released. Yep. So, so developers write the test and use them to develop with and then QA people just run the test. Mm -hmm. And as part of the integration layer, you're saying, let's say throughout the day you're running the integration layer, you're saying there you're not gonna necessarily run your functional test all the time. Some projects do. It's in my in my determination, it's not really best practice because, like I said, it adds a lot of time. Uh, and you and all these developers are working. 
they're submitting pull requests to integration all the time. Yeah. Right. So like I said, we've only got one layer right here. You could have integration, QA, UAT, all of these stacks going yeah. down into the packaging or the master branch. You can say, all right, on integration that we're all working in a bunch, we're not going to run our, our functional tests. Mm -hmm. But once we say, okay, now integration's good, we want to promote a release, we'll do a pull request into the QA org or the QA branch and then we'll run all of the functional tests there. Yeah, that's another right. flag you can do with CircleCI is you can tell it to do one thing on one commit for a certain branch and then another thing for a different branch. So you can say when you actually get to master, before you actually push it into master, actually run all these tests. So that way you don't get a build that takes an hour here. You know, you get a build that takes an hour here once a week or something like that and a build here that takes five minutes. But all of those functional tests are part of the code of your application. Mm -hmm. So like when John, before John does a commit, he can go and run all of those tests locally. So it may just be against a Mac in Chrome, mm -hmm. but he can say, all right, man, all this stuff works and I can go. And locally, they run very quick. Mm -hmm. When you get them into Circle CI, when you push them over to Sauce Labs or Browser Stack or something like that, yeah. they're a little bit slower. Sauce Labs is expensive. Yeah, that's the real right. reason that you don't want to run your tests all the time is because one of our clients, like I was saying, they run their functional tests on pretty much every commit and they have, you know, bills from uh, Circle CI and Sauce Labs. Thousands of dollars a month. Thousands of dollars a month they're spending just to run these functional tests. And a lot of time they just give false negatives. Like mm -hmm. um, the person who's the developer on it, you know, he sees regularly, uh, he'll wake up in the morning and the test will fail and he'll go run the test again and it'll be just fine, you know. You it's one of those things where you don't want to pay for something that's not providing you value. So you get the value early and you get the value after you're done. And just like everything else when we're talking about QA strategy, functional test, apex unit test, you want it to be like the jet fuel in the jet that's allowing you to go faster. You don't want it to be like the anchor on the ship that you finally get into. You're like, oh my God, we have this test suite that's so big and so onerous. It doesn't really tell us what we need to know. It doesn't give us the confidence we need yeah. and we have to maintain it all the time. You know, you have to be pretty diligent about that. So be a little conservative with your functional tests, but still use them. So, yeah, so because we do ISV development, we don't really use sandboxes. We just use developer orgs. Yeah, so what you can do is you can have environment hub enabled in your, um, in your org, which allows you to spin up orgs that aren't sandboxes. So that's good. You know, all of this focuses around things that are packageable, right? So code, metadata, all that kind of stuff. Uh, lead routing rules. A lot of other settings that you have in your org that aren't really code dependent, but kind of like feature configuration. That's what sandboxes are good for. Because you can say all of this is configured this way in my prod org. This is specifically for moving code, metadata, objects, page layouts, all those kind of things that can be packageable. So what we do is this process that's in here, we talked about Git and repos, we talked about Circle CI, we talked about orgs for each branches. When we first started doing this, it would take us like maybe a week or so to configure all this stuff. Yeah. Cause you now have to create all the orgs, you have to create the repo, you have to wire everything up. So we built an internal tool that called Build Science that automates all this. So you walk through a wizard and it says, here's my product, here's my project details, here's all of my team members. Uh, we have other, um, a GitHub repos that we call accelerators, right? So we have an installation wizard that's an accelerator. We have some um, CRUD FLS tools that get us through security review. We have those as accelerators. You go to the next tab, you say, okay, now I want this, 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 and this, kind of like in a shopping cart. And you click deploy and it goes and it creates the orgs for everybody. It creates the Git repo. It creates branches for each one of those orgs. It stores all the refresh tokens and everything in Circle CI and tells Circle CI, okay, now anytime one of these branch changes, go update it. And then for all of your team members, it adds them as users to those individual orgs, and then um, it adds them as collaborators for GitHub. And overall, that's what you have to do to set this up. So for us, we've you know brought 90 products to market on the App Exchange. We've had to do this a lot, so we automated it. <laughs> But if you don't have to do this a lot, it's a one-time thing where you're like, well, it may take me a couple of days to get this done, but once this is up and running and it works, your team will work so much faster yep. in a higher quality manner. Yep. That, that org for each developer really is key to this whole process because if you have multiple people pushing code in the same org, it's never gonna work, especially if you have um, multiple people trying to work in the same org and you have other continuous integration things pushing, it, pushing code into that org itself. 
I mean, you're going to run into problems all the time where somebody created some code in the in the developer console or or in the in the editor itself or in the IDE itself, and um, it's not actually in Git. It gets overwritten. People lose days worth of work. You don't want to do that. You know, don't shoot yourself in the foot. It's it's free to have a developer org. It doesn't cost you anything. You know, create as many developer orgs as you want to, and work in that developer org. And then once you have what you want to work right, then you can take and create a package from that. You can install that package in your sandbox. You can promote that up to your uh, production org. Yeah, and just a quick time check. I think we're four minutes over. So uh, we're happy to stay and answer any questions or anything that you guys have, but I don't want to keep you from the keynote. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for showing interest in this. You know, thanks for being part of that developer community. You know, we're, we're trying to spread the love a little bit and say, hey, this is how code science do does it. You guys may do it totally different. So this is just our flavor of it. Hope you mm -hmm. dug it.